That's what happens when you look at morning sunlight. You're advancing your circadian clock. Translate to English or non-nerd speak, you're making it such that you will want to go to bed a little bit earlier and wake up a little bit earlier the next day. There's a long-standing interest in the relationship between light and mental health and physical health. And we can throw up some very well-agreed upon bullet points. First of all, there is such a thing as seasonal affective disorder. It doesn't just impact people living at really northern locations. But basically, there's a correlation between day length and mood and mental health, such that for many people, not all, but for many people, when days are longer in the spring and summer, they feel better. They report fewer depressive symptoms. And conversely, when days are shorter, significantly more people report feeling lower mood and affect. Okay, so... There's a longstanding treatment for seasonal affective disorder, which is to give people exposure to very bright light, especially in the morning. The way that that's normally accomplished is with these sad lamps, seasonal affective disorder lamps. And those lamps are basically bright, meaning more than 10,000 lux lights that they place on their kitchen counter or at their table in the morning or in their office. So they're getting a lot of bright light. That has proven to be fairly effective for the treatment of seasonal affective disorder. What's less understood is how light exposure in the middle of the night can negatively impact mood and health. And so where we are headed with this is that there seems to be, based on the conclusions of this new study, a powerful and independent role of both daytime light exposure and nighttime dark exposure for mental health. Now, a couple of other key points. The biological mechanisms for all this are really well established. There's a set of cells in the neural retina, which aligns the back of your eye. They're sometimes called intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. They're sometimes called melanopsin retinal ganglion cells. We'll talk about those in a bit of detail in a moment. It's well known that those cells are the ones that respond to two different types of light input not one, but two different types of light input, and send information to the hypothalamus where your master circadian clock resides. And then your master circadian clock sends out secretory signals, so peptides, hormones, but also neural signals to the brain and body and say, hey, now it's daytime, now it's nighttime. Be awake, be asleep. But it goes way beyond that. These melanopsin intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells we know also project to areas of the brain like the habenula, which can trigger negative affect, negative mood. They can trigger the release of dopamine or the suppression of dopamine, the release of serotonin, the suppression of, of serotonin. And so they're not just cells for setting your circadian clock. They also have a direct line, literally one synapse away into the structures of the brain that we know powerfully control mood. So, so the mechanistic basis for all this is there. So there's just a couple of other key points to understand for people to really be able to digest the data in this paper fully. There are basically two types of stimuli that these cells respond to. One is br very bright light, as we just talked about. That's why getting a lot of daytime sunlight is correlated with elevated mood. That's why looking at a 10,000 lux artificial lamp can offset seasonal affective disorder. By the way, just a couple questions on that. Um, how many lux does the sun provide on a sunny day at noon? Okay, great question. So if you're out in the sun with no cloud cover or minimal cloud cover in the middle of the day at noon, chances are it's over 100,000 lux. On a really bright day, could be 300,000 lux, okay? Most indoor environments, even though they might seem very bright, I like to think of your, your kind of like a department store with the bright lights. Believe it or not, that's probably only closer to 6,000 lux maximum and probably more like 4,000 lux. Most brightly lit indoor environments are not that bright when it comes down to total photon energy. Now, Here's the interesting thing. On a cloudy day, when you're outside, it can be as bright as or an average of 100,000 lux, but it won't seem that bright because you don't, quote unquote, see the sun. But it's also because when there's cloud cover, a lot of those long wavelengths of light, such as orange and red light, aren't coming through. However, and this is so important, the circadian clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, 
it sums photons. It's a photon summing system. So basically, if you're outside in 8,000 lux, very overcast UK winter day, and you're walking around, hopefully without sunglasses, because sunglasses are going to filter a lot of those photons out, your circadian clock is summing the photons. So it's an integration mechanism. It's not triggered in a moment. And actually the, the experiments of recording from these cells first done by David Burson at Brown were, you know, historic in the field of visual neuroscience when shown bro bright light on these intrinsically photosensitive cells, you could crank up the intensity of the light and the neurons would ramp up their membrane potential and then start spiking, firing action potentials, or long trains of action potentials that have been shown to go on for hours. And so that's this signal that's propagating into the whole brain and body. Okay, so the, the important thing to understand is this is not a quick switch. That's why I suggest on non-cloudy days, we'll call them, that people get 10 minutes or so of sunlight in their eyes in the early part of the day, another 10 minimum in the later part of the day, as much sunlight in their eyes as they safely can throughout the day. But since you're a physician, I should just, um, and you had a guest on talking about this recently, when the sun is low in the sky, low solar angle sunlight, that's really the key time for reasons we'll talk about in a moment. And when the sun is low in the sky, you run very, very little risk of inducing cataract by looking in the general direction of the sun. You should still blink as needed to protect the eyes. It's when the sun is overhead and there's all those photons coming in quickly in one in a short period of time that you do have to be concerned about cataract and um, macular degeneration if you're getting too much daytime sunlight so the idea is sunglasses in the middle of the day are fine but you really should avoid using them in the early and later part of the day unless you're driving into the sun and you need you know for safety reasons well, another question andrew yeah if if a person is indoors but they have large windows so they're they're getting tons of sunlight into their space they don't even need ambient indoor light how much of the photons are making it through the glass and how does that compare to this effect? Yeah, in general, unless the light is coming directly through the window, most of the relevant wavelengths are filtered out. In other words, if you can't see the sun through the window, even if sufficient light is being provided, that's insufficient to trigger this phenomenon? That's right. However, if you have um, you know, windows on your roof, which some people do, skylights, that makes the situation much, much better. In fact, the neurons that in the eye that signal to the circadian clock and these mood centers in the brain reside mainly in the bottom two thirds of the neural retina and are responsible for looking up. Basically, they're gathering light from above. These cells are also very low resolution. So think of them as big pixels. Uh, they're not interested in patterns and edges and movement. They're interested in how much ambient light there happens to be. Now, keep in mind that this mechanism is perhaps the most well-conserved mechanism in cellular organisms. So there, and I'll use that as a way to frame up the four types of light that one needs to see every 24 hours for optimal health. And, and when I say optimal health, I really mean mental health and physical health, but we're going to talk about mental health mainly today in this paper. There's an absolutely beautiful evolutionary story whereby single cell organisms all the way to humans, dogs, rabbits, and everything in between have at least two cone opsins, one that responds to short wavelength light, aka blue light, and another one that responds to longer wavelength light, orange and red. So your dogs have this, we have this, and it's a comparison mechanism in these cells of the eye, these neurons of the eye. They compare contrast between blues and orange, or sometimes blues and reds and pinks, which are also all long wavelength light. There are two times of day when the sky is enriched with blues, oranges, pinks, and reds, and that's low solar angle sunlight at sunrise and in the evening. These cells are uniquely available to trigger the existence of those wavelengths of light early in the day and in the evening, not in the middle of the day. So these cells have these two cone photopigments and they say, how much blue light is there? How much red light is there or orange light? And the subtraction between those two triggers the signal for them to fire the signal off to the cir circadian clock of the brain. And that's why I say, look at low solar angle sunlight early in the day. What that does is it what we call it is phase advances the clock. This can get a little technical and we don't want to get too technical here, but think about pushing your kid on a swing. 
the period of that swing, the duration of that swing is a little bit longer than 12 hours. Okay. So when you stand closer to the kid, so he's, your kid swings back and you give it an, a push, you're shortening the period, right? You're not allowing the swing to come all the way up. That's what happens when you look at morning sunlight. You're advancing your circadian clock. Translate to English or non-nerd speak, you're making it such that you will want to go to bed a little bit earlier and wake up a little bit earlier the next day. In the evening, when you view low solar angle sunlight, so in the, after, the afternoon setting sun or evening setting sun, you do the exact opposite. You're phase delaying the clock. It's the equivalent of your kid being at the very top of the, of the arc and so it's gone, you know, maybe 12 and a half hour, uh, 12, let's say 12 and a half hours is the duration of that swing. And you run up and you push them from behind and give them a little more push. That's the equivalent of making yourself stay up a little later and wake up a little later. These two signals average so that your clock stays stable. You don't drift, meaning you're not waking up earlier every single day or going to sleep later every single day. This is why it's important to view low solar angle sunlight in the morning and again in the evening as often as possible. And it's done by that readout of those two photopigments. Now, midday sun, which contains its bright light, but you see it as white light, contains all of those wavelengths at equal intensity. So the middle of the day is the so-called circadian dead zone. In the middle of the day, bright light triggers the activation of the, of the other opsin, the melanopsin, which increases mood, increases feelings of well-being, has some other consequences, but you can't shift your circadian clock by viewing the sun in the middle of the day because it's in the circadian dead zone. It's the equivalent of pushing your kid on the swing when they're at the bottom of the arc. You can get a little bit more, but not much. And in biological terms, you get nothing. So this is why looking at sunlight in the middle of the day is great, but it's not gonna help anchor your sleep-wake cycle. And if you think about it, this is incredible, right? Every organism, from single cells to us has this mechanism to know when the sun is rising and when the sun is setting. And it's a color comparison mechanism, which tells us that actually color vision evolved first, not for pattern vision, not for seeing beautiful sunsets and recognizing that's beautiful or paintings or things of that sort, but rather for setting the circadian clock.